Hey everybody, once again, welcome back. This is David. This time, instead of squad leader, I'm talking advanced squad leader from the Avalon Hill Game Company. This comes from 1985. Be a brief backgrounder for those that don't know. Squad leader led to the game ads, Cross of Iron, Crescendo of Doom, and GI Anvil of Victory. Each one of these game ads added on to the squad leader system such that by the time GI Anvil of Victory came out in 1983, that there were contradictions and so forth throughout the rules. For example, the tank rules here overrided that, some of the infantry movement rules, and GI Anvil of Victory introduced a lot more um, concepts. So we ended up with a scattered system, so they brought them all together and added even more to it, into the Advanced Squad Leader system. So previously I did a our squad leader scenarios one and two and three, guards counterattack, the tractor works, and finally the streets of Stalingrad. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take us through those same three scenarios, but using the advanced squad leader system, starting with advanced squad leader scenario alpha, the guards counterattack, same background, Special rules are slightly different. Everything looks very similar, but there are some key differences. So, let's have a look. Again, the one thing that's the same, victory conditions are more important than anything else on the card. And that's the same for Advanced Squad Leader. You can see the turn record chart looks the same. The setup and all that looks very, very similar, but there are some key differences. Let's start in here. Victory conditions. They talk about control. Talk about ratio of unbroken squad equivalents. Equivalents? What's that mean? Well, we'll come up to that. Board uh, configuration is the same. Balance? Ignore this. Talk about the turn record chart. German sets up first and so forth. Then we get into the units. And then superficially, they look the same. But there are some differences. For example, in I-7, there's only two light machine guns, not three. Looking at the light machine guns, they have a firepower of three, not two. So those are some things. Zooming in on the German squads, they have something different. There is a superscript of the numeral one after their firepower of four. And the range of six is underlined. This is all important. You'll notice the range for the light machine gun is also underlined. Coming down to the Russians, they are all identical, except this guy right here. He has a 9 negative 0 instead of the 8 negative 0. That means he is a commissar. He has special rules for him. There's way too many rules to talk about the differences here. But the one thing I will mention right now is immediately is that the Germans uh, are not quite ready to set up. I'll explain. For most nationalities, but that does not include the Russians, prior to set up, that unit, or sorry, that element can take one-tenth of its squads, not squad equivalents, but squads, and deploy them into half squads. These fractions are rounded up. So we have three, six, nine, 12, 13 squads. We can take 1.3 squads, round up to two. We can take two of these squads, any two squads, and we can deploy them into half squads. What's the, what does that mean? Let's have a look. On the left, we have a squad. You notice there are three figures on that on the counter. On the right, we have two half squads. You'll notice that there are two figures on those counters. Those figures are all standing. Wow, there's a guy kneeling, but ignore him. Three means a squad is also equal to their unit size. The unit size is three. Over here, the unit size is two. Two half squads equals one squad. But how do we know which half squad goes with which squad? In the upper right corner, we have a numeral one, just like these guys do. That means they are first line units. Therefore, as many squads as, as, as you can, in this case two, we can take two squads and break them into half squads. The trade-off is you get more units, but you lose the ability to spray fire. That's what the underlined range means. And you lose the inherent smoke generation capacity which the super numeral one means. Get to that as the game goes on. All right, the Germans are now gonna set up. 
I will set it up and then explain my rationale. The Germans have now set up, but let's have a look at some of the differences. First of all, when you look at this, uh, it's very clear in the rules. When you look at a stack, you're not allowed to inspect what's underneath it. For example, here we know there's a 467 on level 1. That's what the gray counter means. Something underneath it with the other guy down here. Over here, we know there's somebody on level 2. So that's the key difference here. Uh, just to be talking about the terrain itself. Let's look at this building as an example. It has three hexes or more, and it has a stairwell. Three hex or any three hex or two hexes or more means it has a ground level and a, an upper level. So level zero and level one. With the stairs, it means it has three levels: level zero, one, and two. And those stairwells are the ways to go up and down. So these guys have decided to go up here so they can shoot over this level one building, blind hex, and then they can see into over here. There's a light machine gun medium here, and the rest are across the way. You can tell right away that a couple of guys, or one of the guys, have deployed over here. But without talk, without looking into it, the Russians have no idea uh, if they've deployed there or not, because they're not allowed to speak, or to peek. Let's set the Russians up. And the Russians have set up, and it doesn't look that much different, but there are some differences that you'll have to note. For example, up here with the medium machine gun, you notice it's on top. In advanced squad leader, possession of support weapons is denoted, donated, is shown thus. You put the support weapon on top of the unit that's carrying it. In this case, the medium machine gun is being carried by this squad. The 9 minus 1, I just put them on top for now. Normally, I put my leaders on the bottom, for example, in this text. Don't tell the Russians. He's right there. Okay. Also over here, you'll notice that I have my guys spread out. These guys are at level one, underneath, all the way around. So the two guys in the bottom are adjacent to each other. The guys in the stairwell are adjacent, and he's adjacent to him. So we have a multi-hex, in this case known as a multi-location uh, fire group. Okay. We're set up and ready to go? No, we're not. Because prior to the game, there's a couple things we have to do. Two things we have to go, do are, first of all, concealment gains, and second of all, placing snipers. Every game in Advanced Squad Leader, snipers are inherent. And you'll notice this in the scenario card. And let's have a look. We come all the way over here and look at the Germans, for example. They talk about, you know, who they are, whatever. San, six. Russians, talk about the setup. San is six. Let's talk about that for a moment. The San, S-A-N, sniper activation number, basically means that when your opponent rolls that number in many, but not all, but many of the fire of the phases, it will activate your sniper, allowing you to see if you can attack with it. As the gameplay goes on in my example, we'll, we'll show you how. Another element in a scene on the scenario card is something called ELR, Experience Level Rating. Basically, if you fail a morale check by more than this number, then you're going to lower in quality. All right, let's get the, uh, now on to the concealment gains. Before kicking off the game, the first thing we have to do is see if anybody on either side is out of uh, line of sight, completely out of line of sight of the enemy. If they are, they gain concealment. Looking right now, this guy is out of line of sight of everyone. And we'll have a look. Probably this guy right here as well is inside that building. I will now go and check out the line of sights, uh, lines of sight and put concealment counters on any applicable units. Let's do that now. I've checked, and to the best of my ability, the following units are out of line of sight. For the Russians, nobody can see this guy here. There's nobody down here that can see him. Coming across these two units, there's nobody on this side that can see him. I mean, their line of sight is blocked over here. He's out of line of sight. For the Germans, well, actually, I missed one. We know this guy's out of line of sight from him. He's out of line of sight, and so is he. 
I'll make that change and then we'll talk about snipers. Snipers are placed. Both sides have very high sniper activation numbers. What I've done with the Germans, I've placed him here. It's a few hexes away from him. And, but basically you have to make sure you're within six hexes of at least six units. One, two, three, four, five, six, six locations. He's the same, he's in, in charge of all here. But he put himself down second as the attacker and he put himself close to the German sniper to try to get a little sniper activation number going on. Or a sniper battle, I should say. All right, we're ready to start the game. Well, now let's go to the, well, it's a Russian turn, turn one. I've got the charts handy. Most everything I need is right on here. Got my dice tower and I have my dice. One die is colored and that's part of the rules as it has been since GI Anvil of Victory. First thing we do, set up any reinforcements, done. Any repairs, etc. Russians are not allowed to are not allowed to deploy. They're not shifting any support weapons around, so it's time to check to see if there's a weather change. Beginning of every, or in the rally phase, I should say, of every turn, every player turn, roll two dice. A two or a 12 will result in either wind change or gusts. There's no effect. So, now it's on to the Russian prep fire phase. All right, we're going to kick off with the prep fire phase. We'll start over here. Remember that the 447s in the lower level are adjacent locations. He's adjacent due to the stairwell, and he's adjacent to him. So they're all next to each other one way or another. They form a continual chain, continuous chain. They are going to fire at that mini machine gun two hexes away. Normal range, firepower of 16 plus 3. Roll the 9. 9 plus 3 is 12. 12 on the 16 column is no effect. They did not activate the sniper, so let's carry on. This guy up here is going to shoot across the way. If you remember, I said that they can't uh, inspect um, stacks during setup. Once you have line of sight to a known unit and you prove that you're a real unit, you can check. So we saw down below, there is a leader along with a... Um, uh, there's a leader... What else do you have with him? Uh, two half squads and two like, machine guns. He's going to fire at him. If you remember, he's got the 447, he's got the medium machine gun, and he's got the minus one leader. Firepower eight, DRM plus three for the building, minus one for the leader, and they roll uh, three. Note the color die is a one. The rate of fire of that machine gun is two. Roll that rate of fire or less, and they can shoot again. But let's have a look at the results first. Firepower 8, 3, plus 2 is 5. 5 on the 8 column is a 2 morale check. Let's go check the results. Plus 2 morale check. We always check the leader first. Roll 2 dice. 6 plus 2 is 8. 8 equals his morale. He pins. That's also a sniper activation number. Sniper activation numbers, uh, if... You check for them. Happen after uh, the fire or whatever that causes. So we have to check the rest of the morale before we see if the sniper actually shoots. Next guy, morale of seven. Four plus two is six. Less than his morale, he's fine. Last guy rolls a seven plus two is a nine. He breaks. Let's apply the results. All right, underneath there, there's a couple things. The uh, Leader has a pin marker on it. One of the half squads has broken him, has a DM placed on it. Also notice that the medium machine gun, because he is in a building or woods, and he fired and has a rate of fire, his cover arc is fixed along one of the hex spines. Chose to fire this way. But before we do that, we see if the Russian sniper activates. If you roll a one or a two, the sniper will activate. Your roll of one it means it is what we call a kill shot or a big sniper. You roll a two, it is a baby sniper. In this case, you rolled a one. The sniper activates. Noting where the sniper is, with the one up in line with the numerals on the board, the red die will represent the direction, and the white die will represent distance of where it goes. Direction two for distance of one. Direction two for distance of one puts him there. 
From there, what he has to do is go to the nearest enemy, in this case, German unit. In this case, there are three units that are equidistant. And here we have a NATO with a bunch of guys and they have the guys upstairs. We have him and we have him. It's a tie. Next, we have to see if the terrain effect modifiers are different. The one with the least amount of terrain effect modifier he will hit. In this case, all of them have the same TEM. He can choose where to go. He chooses to attack this hex. Let's resolve it and see how that happens. So I placed the sniper on that hex. Now, correction does not attack a hex. It attacks a location, which would be key if I chose to go here. I could choose upstairs or downstairs, not both. I chose to go here, and you'll see why in a moment. There are two units in the hex. I'm going to roll two dice, random selection. Uh, the color die will be represent this guy, and the non-color die, will, or the white die, will be that die. Highest one gets hit. In this case, it hit uh, the squad. If it hits a squad, the effect is it will break that squad. I will now apply the results. So random event happened here. The squad in here broke. Nobody is manning that machine gun. There's an eight negative one in that hex. Now this road is relatively uncovered. All right. Now remembering that he kept his rate of fire, he's gonna to decide to keep shooting and he's gonna fire with the medium machine gun only on this hex. Firepower four, DRM plus two. Three for the building, and negative one for the leader. Rolls a five. Five plus two is a seven. Seven on the uh, four column is a PTC. Pin task check. Also, he got rid of fire. Pin task check is like a morale check. Basically, you got to roll less than or equal to your morale to pass it. Roll the six. He's fine. However, that is the sniper activation number. Let's see if the Russian sniper activates. Rolls a three, he does not. All right, he got ready to fire again. Let's fire and see what happens. Roll the five, plus two is seven. Pin task check, got raid. Firing it, or uh, pin task check. Let's see what happens. Roll the seven, equals to his morale. He's fine, he does not break. Firing again. His luck ran out, rolled a 9, plus 2 is 11, there is nothing. All right, I think we've seen enough here uh, from this video alone to see that the fire phase is already completely different. We've had random activation of a sniper, which broke a squad here. We had a machine gun here, maintain its rate of fire, its fire uh, axe, our cover arc was fixed, and he switched target to a different target within there. We saw the pin task check on here, and saw what happened when the leader broke uh, here. Unlike the basic game, there is no leader loss uh, morale check for the same reasons. You still have them, but basically if the squad has a lower morale than the, than the leader, then they don't have to check for, or you do have to check if it's a higher morale. So I think I missed that. In that case, I'm going to go to famous rule A.2. A.2 means if you make a mistake and you realize later, you just keep playing. But what should have happened is this. The eight morale guy, if he broke, which he didn't, but if he broke, then it would cost a leader loss task check for the guys in the hex with them. So I did everything right. Okay, next video will be about movement and defensive fire phase. It is completely different from the basic game, so I'm going to make a new video for that. Until then, take care.